Today is December 3rd, 2003. Uh, we're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, doing an interview in connection with the Veterans History Project. My name is Joe Bruckner. And would you please state your name, sir? Uh, Barney Schoenberg. And my birth was March 24th, 1918. I was born in Savannah, Georgia, and we moved to Atlanta when I was nine months old. Mr. Schoenberg, would you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Uh, <clears throat> my mother and father were, were Russian immigrants before the First World War. And uh, they met in Atlanta and they got married and, I, and my father moved to Savannah. He was a, a metal worker and I was born in Savannah. Moved back to Atlanta and I've lived in Atlanta ever since. Uh, we came from a lower middle class sort of family. It's worked for a living. I went to uh, Crew Street School. I went to Hoke Smith Junior High School. And I went to three of the high schools in Atlanta but never graduated. <clears throat> my family needed uh, my assistance, I assumed, and I went to work in a dress factory at uh, $15 a week and I gave my mama $5 and I uh, used the rest for expenses. <clears throat> had various different average jobs and then when the war broke out, didn't break out, no, before the war broke out, I was drafted around August of 1941, in August, I think, 1941. <clears throat> you want me to continue to where I was? Uh, so I was, uh, I, uh, was uh, <coughs> uh, signed up at Fort McPherson, inducted to Fort McPherson and sent to Fort Eustis, Virginia for basic training. It was an anti-aircraft basic training camp, which was near Chesapeake Bay area and that area of the East Coast. <coughs> uh, after basic training of three months, I was sent to Camp Davis, North Carolina, anti-aircraft base, and uh, we were there for a couple of months, and uh, as I was sitting on the bed one Sunday morning with a friend, we heard on the radio that the war had broke out, and everybody was stunned. No one could say anything. What was your feeling about that? Uh, what was your mind? It was such a shock, we couldn't believe it because we believed it after a couple of times they kept repeating it on the, t on the radio, we didn't have TV. And uh, we looked at each other, we had friends uh, <coughs> from Atlanta, a few of them and so forth. <coughs> it, it, was, it, 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 it was beyond belief, you know. <coughs> we knew war was going to come because of Germany and all that. But we didn't think that Japan would would come into the war at this stage of the game because <clears throat> everything was in the in, in Europe. So I was uh, anyway. We were sent to. Uh, I was picked as part of a group. See, our company was about two hundred and fifty men. And I was picked about 15 to 15 men out of come to, to make a nucleus anti-aircraft group because this group was, I didn't know at this time, but it became a suicide force and we were shipped, I, we went to Oakland, California, we shipped to Christmas Island, 1,500 miles south of Hawaii, which was a protection base around the Hawaiian Islands. There was the Aleutians, Guam, and the Gilberts, uh, Palmyra's on the south near the uh, uh, equator. I was 100, about 100 miles from the equator. Now, now before you went overseas, uh, tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day life training, what you did, and well, the experiences I was... you had with people in these towns that were new. <clears throat> I'll tell you the truth. In the years that I was in the service, I think I went to one uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, USOs. USOs. 
I wasn't in, a, in areas where there were USOs. Uh, my training was was the usual training, I guess. So we, you, you know, the training. Uh, we had a lot of people in the, in in the base that were their level of uh, san sanitation and, and lifestyle was. I don't mean to say it, but it was way below mine. Uh, you know, my parents taught me to be clean and to be nice and to go to school and do the best you can and get a job in the grocery store on the Saturdays and make a buck and a half a, uh, to help at the house. When I we went to, to the camp, they, the basic training part, part of it was to tell boys how to, how to bathe and how to brush their teeth. And uh, but the basics of life that the average person, I thought the average person all knew that. But I was surprised that a lot of these boys were from out of farms and up east and and, and west and they were just. Uh, but a lot of a lot of the fellas didn't. Uh, most of them were. I wouldn't say most, but a lot of them didn't. And the basic training started there, with hygiene, how to make your beds and all that stuff. Then we got camp, uh, we get camp training with uh, guns and so forth. Uh, we didn't have they didn't have too many rifles at that time. We were short at that time, the government. But we made do. It wasn't uh, it wasn't like uh, like the uh, Rangers, anything like that. It was just basic soldiering, marching and. Keeping things clean and keeping your rifles clean, <clears throat> and teaching people to respect authority, because when you get out of basic training, when they say jump, you jump. It just becomes ingrained in you every day. <clears throat> what did you feel about the quality of your leaders, your officers, and your? Well, the basic training wasn't. Uh, that was uh, that was something that uh, those leaders were there permanent. They were sergeants that trained you, you know, and then you moved out, and then they got another bunch in. But when I got to Camp Davis, we experiment. <coughs> we had uh, big searchlights you, to shine up in the, in the air to spot airplanes <coughs> and anti-craft, craft, and aircraft guns, <coughs> which we my company had bofors and and lights. These were big lights. But they weren't very effective, and the both of guns weren't effective either. They were about six to eight millimeters. I don't know, but uh, they they weren't effective. And uh, <clears throat> also, we had uh, computers. I wasn't associated with that, but that was in in the group in the company, and and a computer, believe it or not was in a semi-trailer. That's how big those computers were in those days. And today they got them about, a hand. you can hold them by the hand. But they were all uh, made out of, uh, the tubes were made out of glass and so forth. But it was amazing. And they tried to track the planes. But I'll tell you the truth. Our anti-aircraft system wasn't, wasn't very proficient. Then I, from there, we were sent, uh, as soon as the war broke out, we were sent to Fort Monroe, uh, Virginia, to be shipped out. And that's over there near, uh, near Norfolk and Chesapeake Bay area. And so. Shipped out to Oakland, California on the docks, ready to be shipped. God knows where. We didn't know where it was going. They issued us uh, parkers and heavy clothing. And we were quarantined in this big docks, uh, you know, shipping docks, the, the tremendous. And we stayed there two days. All of a sudden, they come around, picking up all that stuff. And then they came with uh, these pit helmets and shorts and short sleeve shirts khakis and all your military and <laughs> this I, I know was to confuse the enemy 
because there was a lot of Japanese in, in that part of the country. And uh, so anyhow, put on a ship. The ship was, uh, was, wasn't was used before, but during the war, let me, and. Uh, this was still 1941? Or 42, This comes in 42. The war broke out in 1941. It was right there, right at probably January. So I didn't stay. We, all this happened within a month when they shipped us from one place to another to get. Uh, <clears throat> when, they, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, they wanted to put a perimeter around Pearl Harbor to protect Pearl Harbor, protect the Hawaiian Islands because the Japanese wanted to take And they could have probably did it. Uh, <clears throat> And we were sent to Christmas Island, which was a task force on a, on a ship. And uh, it was an old ship. It was a luxury liner in that day, of course, but that wasn't what it was used for. They put bunks and all. Then uh, when we got to the island, it was, it was a coral island owned by the English. It was the coconut trees on the coral island. Once a year, the English would come, a ship would come, and take the coconuts and harvest them and take them back. It was just a desolate island. But <clears throat> they threw a cargo net over the side of the ship. It was tremendously high. If you've been on a ship, you know, it, it seems like a thousand feet high. We had to carry everything on our backs that we owned, the rifle and all our possessions coming down that cargo net. And if you fell, you were dead because you, it was too, it was so high. But nobody fell because they, they were so uh, apprehensive. And we got on a little boat or something and took us into the island. You got to remember, this was uh, this was a desolate island just with a beach and coconut trees on it. I stayed there ten months. Am I going taking too much time? Just want to be sure this is up here. Okay. <laughs> so after 10 months, uh, I was sent to Hawaii, Schofield Barracks. <clears throat> and I became a first sergeant, Schofield Barracks, and they sent me to Camp Hahn, California, an aircraft base as, as a first sergeant. And uh, I didn't, uh, I had a captain from New York City that uh, didn't like me very well. <laughs> he told me that after he busted me. <laughs> he said, I tried to bust you for three months, but I couldn't find anything wrong with you, and I found it in the book. He had the nerve. But anyway, I applied for a for cadet training airplane pilot. Went to Marchfield and sent me to, school, uh, to uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, <coughs> for uh, examinations. Took eight hours a day, three days of intensive testing. And they said, well, you didn't make it as a pilot, but you made it as a bombardier. I said, okay, I'll take bombardier. <laughs> and they sent me over to Seminole, Texas, as training, pre-cadet training. <laughs> That's when the bus threw at St. Lo in Germany. They lost so many men. They took all ground force men out of the, the when the cadet training, all the college boys and all, they sent them overseas, except I had too many stripes and they put me in the armored infantry in Camp Bowie, Texas. And I had too many stripes, I said, I ain't gonna march behind these these tanks, <laughs> you get killed marching behind a tank. <laughs> so they transferred me to a quartermaster, headquarters quartermaster company, which I went to Austin, Texas. There's a camp out of Austin, Texas. And from there, um, they, they, I, uh, I went, they sent me back. I was in the Philippine invasion. <clears throat> Tell us about the Philippine invasion. When did you find out you were going to actually be going into combat? 
<laughs> you, don't, you don't know. <laughs> I never was in a in a major force. I always was a specialized. Nobody wanted me really, <laughs> but I was in small units. And when, I, <clears throat> well, when I was in the quartermaster headquarters company, I was in a company. But what we were attached to, I don't know. But I was sent over to the Philippine invasion, <clears throat> and. Uh, We, we didn't know exactly where we were. They don't tell you anything. In war, a lot of people don't know, they don't tell you. We uh, stopped in New Guinea and places, and it took us 30 days from the States to the Philippines. <clears throat> we got there, we landed. The first forces already landed. The infantry landed, you know. They cleared the way for us. We came in, <clears throat> we set up dumps, food dumps and so forth, tremendous dumps of food. We were storing that food really for the Philippine invasion. And the, I mean the Japanese invasion because they were, after Germany failed, the Japanese uh, didn't have any good support. <clears throat> and we was in the Philippines. <clears throat> And there was a dock. It was Tacloban, Lady Tacloban. That's right. <clears throat> the docks. Well, everything's water in those islands. It's hard to believe, but there's no front lines in, in on those islands because uh, you could be a cook or you could be anything. Uh, if the enemy starts come at you, you have to do what you can. <clears throat> so they moved us to. To uh, to the Mindanao, I think that's where Hawaii, I think where Manila is on the beach. I never saw Manila, but we wanted a beach, and they brought their troops from all over the world, from India and all. It was all massing to for the invasion of Japan, and I happened to see my brother's company. He was in a port company. He was in England or France or somewhere. And I see his name, the company's name on the roster of, of companies and so forth. I said, you know, my brother was in that company. I ain't seen him in over a year. And so I looked for on the beach. I finally found somebody from Port Company. He says, that, that's him coming out of the water there. It's been, and he came, and I didn't recognize him. I didn't, he recognized me, but I didn't recognize him. And we really went all the way around the world and met in 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 the in Hawaii in the Philippines. Did and you have any time to spend with him there? Just a short period of time, <clears throat> very short. We went. Uh, they put us on LST. If you've ever been on LST, it's a flat bottom boat. It's not made for what they did. They put us on that thing and shipped us over to Hawaii. Took us. I mean, to Japan. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of mistakes made in the service and all during war, but that's natural, and I, it's no use going into <laughs> to the. <laughs> I was in New Guinea, and uh, the troops, the troops didn't care for General MacArthur at all. Why was that? He was an arrogant person. He was raised in the Philippines. And if you know the Japanese, there's a lot of Japanese culture there. And his father was a military man. And he, he was an aristocratic sort of person. He wasn't the sort of he was. He built a big uh, house over there in New Guinea and all the soldiers were sleeping on the ground, things like that. But he was a great general. I can't take it away. He's a great. He was a great general. But the troops just didn't care for him because he didn't have the charisma for the troops. Uh, if you were in the uh, Japanese structure, there's a level of structure. There's the peasants, there's the middle class, and the high class. And a peasant could never get higher than a first lieutenant, no matter how brilliant he was. Everything was in a class structure. But anyhow, we, when the war was over, we let, we, it took us 30 days on the LSD, 
to reach Japan. And it was in January or something. It was, we had storms and all yeah, in the channel. About what period of time was this? You said this, the war was over? Yeah, uh, they, yeah, that's when the Japanese surrendered oh, okay. to MacArthur on the ship. Well, let's go back to after you, when you first went overseas, back when you got, when you were in the Philippines. What that's the second time I went overseas. Okay. Okay. What was your job when you were in the Philippines? What was your specific My job? specific job in the Philippines was I was in charge, I was a sergeant in charge of of the of the of the food dump. Now I'm talking about food dump. We ain't talking about no little dump. The the beer the beer stack in itself must have been as tall as nearly a two story house and, and maybe a hundred feet wide. You can't imagine the massiveness of, of what preparedness for an invasion is. <clears throat> Then uh, the ships were bringing in food supplies, and we were storing it in late in, in Tacloban and Leyte. <clears throat> uh, Admiral Nimitz's ships were in the channel there, uh, and uh, I, I, I was in charge of that. Uh, I had a lieutenant, but he was a drunkard, so I did. I had to do everything that. Uh, so uh, that's what we, we stored supplies. Now, on your first trip over, first time you went overseas, what was your primary job there? I was a company clerk. Uh, <clears throat> somebody had to be company clerk, and I could write. <laughs> uh, um, but people don't understand, on those islands, there's no front lines, no back lines. It's it's uh, on Christmas Island. There's a 65 mile coastline with 2,500 troops to protect it and supply it and do everything. <clears throat> the main reason was that island there, well we were there, is for the airstrip. Airplanes going from the states to Hawaii to Australia in that area. They had to stop over to gas and refill. There wasn't. It was prop planes only. There was no such thing as as jets, and they they could only go so far. <clears throat> and these pilots, they were civilian pilots to fly those planes to the areas where we go. We didn't have that many. Car. But they uh, <clears throat> they carried machetes. They carried guns. They carried everything for self-preservation because they had to fly over these jungle areas to get where they're going. And it's hard to visualize if you've never been there, but <clears throat> they would fly in, get gassed up, get food or whatever they need, and go ahead. And that's all it was. It was a, a landing strip, but it was also an outpost for the Hawaiian perimeter. In either one of these assignments, did you ever get in a situation where you were feared for your life, or was it a constant fear? Or? Well, I thought I'd never come back uh, because on, on Christmas Island, there's Japanese submarines circling us every once in a while. You could see them come up. <clears throat> but they didn't shoot at us. I, I think they were, because they wanted the island. They wanted the airstrip. But they, at that time, right after the, the war started, they, they were in charge, you know, really, the Japanese. <clears throat> and they thought, uh, I assume that they thought these islands would be great jumping grounds to Hawaii and to the States. I don't think they ever thought they could conquer the United States, but they, they wanted to pressure the states into whatever, the politics of life. So life didn't make, mean anything to the Japanese. They, 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 uh, <clears throat> a lot of their submarines and kamikaze planes, well, they were suicide planes. <clears throat> uh, now I didn't see the kamikazes till I got to, J 
to the Philippines. Tell us about that. Uh, well, <clears throat> you look up into the sky and you see this plane flying around. <laughs> and you know he's a kamikaze because we knew what they looked like. They can't go back. They have to, they, they, they're suicide force. They're like these Arabs going and killing people. They had a flimsy plane, just enough gas to go where they come. And they had a, a bomb load. And they had to drop it. If they couldn't drop it on their target. See, we were in the, in the Philippines. We were, Admiral Nimitz's ships were, fleet was in between the channel between Cebu and, <coughs> and uh, yeah, Leite. Leite. <coughs> and they were trying to bomb some of his ships, but they, they couldn't get that close. But when you're looking, he, you don't know if he's going to drop it on you or not. Because they, they, they're not aiming for anything special. After they miss their, their, <coughs> their target area, they, they've got to drop the bombs to the secondary target or whatever they can find. So it's a very scary thing to look up there and say, you don't know where he's going to drop those bombs. Where are these other guys coming over going to drop those bombs? Uh... And we also had in the Philippines, we had some of the Japanese soldiers would come out of the hills and dress. They were starving. And they'd come in out food lines sometimes. And they looked like, we didn't dress up. We didn't, we didn't, you wouldn't think we were soldiers over in this part of the world. No salute, none of that stuff. There's none of that kind of stuff. We, no marching, no nothing. Everything was, <laughs> military was protection and fighting and and so they could sometimes they'd get in the line and they wanted to get food. Otherwise, sometimes we'd catch them, sometimes we couldn't. But they 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 they'd go they'd get back out, you know. They'd well, sometimes leave. they weren't detected. They would. Yeah, they they just they well, they wanted some food because everybody looked alike. And the Philippines, we used a lot of Filipinos for service people, like carrying boxes and various things, whatever. And they all look alike. Because there are a lot of Philippines, a lot of Japanese in, in the islands. So it was very difficult, just like you have today in Iraq. You can't tell the good from the bad because they all look alike. It's very difficult. But we didn't have that much trouble like they have in Iraq. <clears throat> well, that's it. And I went to, when I got into Japan, you want me to... You said you started shipping over to Japan. So when you were... Sh when you were shipping, what was We didn't ship into Japan. But you started on... We, we, in the Philippines, we stockpiled <coughs> for the invasion of Japan. Okay. Uh, somebody else shipped supplies over to Japan. Uh, <coughs> I was in advanced forces, and uh, the, the dump was there, and we, like I say, they... They put us all together on the island of Mindanao to be different ships to go over it as invasion forces. <clears throat> Did you deal with some of the soldiers that were going to be part of the invasion force? Oh, yeah, we were all there. We were all together. What was there, the, the people that were actually going to be on the ships heading over? What? We were all on the ships. I mean, uh, we was on one ship. There's, uh, there's lots of ships going over. Okay, so you were on your way over to Japan? Yeah. What was your feeling going over there? What what did you feel was going to happen? We didn't know. We just didn't know. <clears throat> uh, we was in the China Sea for about 30 days in a tornado, a hurricane. The China Sea is a rough country, a <coughs> rough sea during the, in the winter months. <clears throat> and we were on this LSD for over 30 days. And this LSD would go up and down, up and had no keel. It was made for invasion forces, short-term invasion. <laughs> we were just trying to stay alive, if you want to know the truth about it, <laughs> uh, on the ship. There really wasn't a ship. But when we got to Japan, they dropped the door down, or whatever you call it, the ramp. We all came out. Ready for whatever might happen. 
Nothing happened. The people greeted us. They didn't greet us on the dock, but when we got into the to, to Wakayama, Japan, <coughs> which was a city there, which we was <coughs> we were stationed in a steel mill, and then supplies were being brought in, and uh, we took care of that with trucks. We bring it, taken to various sources from the steel mill. They had the big warehouses in there, you know, steel. But uh, you ask, uh, when you're in combat and you get out and you go back, uh, you don't think you're going to come back. And uh, you do the best you can, that's all. But you don't expect, I didn't expect to come back. But I did come back. Uh, and God willing, I came back. It wasn't my fault I came back. It was just plain dumb luck. Because when you, it's you're just like you see in, 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 in Iraq and all, these poor guys, they don't know when they're going to get shot or not. It's, it's basically the same type of situation, <clears throat> except a different type of world. Uh, those people in Japan were conditioned as a, uh, like a 2,000 year old regime. <clears throat> Each block in the city was controlled by a police. Big block. It, but it was blocked because Japan is a lot of little cities, a lot of big cities, a little, but Wakayama is about 300,000 people. <clears throat> and they controlled everything those people did. They couldn't leave that block unless they reported to the policemen that, <clears throat> that they were going somewhere. Very, very tightly controlled country. And when they, when the government told them that we were the conquerors to treat us with respect, they did. Because they were told to do that. In America, you tell me some people say, well, we're going to do this. But they were all regimented from childhood, years and years. And that's... Uh, <clears throat> But as the, the, the people uh, were educated, uh, their second language is English. They couldn't speak it, but they could read it. And then steel mill, they used all our <clears throat> United, American, United States chemical society books or something. They point, like every year they send out chemicals, different, you know, engineering and so forth. And all their books and all in the, in the offices was American books. They did everything we, from those books and what they learned where those people came over here and went back. They built that war effort on, 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 on America. American steel was sent over there on ships, if you remember, if you've heard about that. <clears throat> we sent scrap iron over there, ship after ship after ship. And it came back in bombs. <clears throat> and believe it or not, we're doing that in this country, in India, <clears throat> Romania, Latvia. We, we have trained. Can I go back to today? Are you, you like this shit? Where do you want me to start? The atomic bomb? Yeah, where were you when the, <clears throat> you heard the atomic bomb was dropped? I was in late in Japan. And it's in the daytime. I was in taking care of the dump, you know. They ain't we talking about supply dumps. We ain't talking about no little dump. We're talking about big, large masses of food and supplies. Uh, it's hard to visualize, but when you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of troops that need everything, you got big dumps. Because didn't have no warehouses in the Philippines. <clears throat> I was in the Philippines, this is, I remember like the day we heard the war was, was over. The ships and the ports and all were shooting up all their, uh, what do you call it, rockets, the uh, emergency rockets and shoots, you know, from case of uh, flares. flares, all the flares. They got all those big ships, everybody shooting flares, the biggest skyrocket you ever saw. <clears throat> and I'm there in the dump, the gate. 
here comes a great big tank through the gate with soldiers all over them. Where are we going? To that beer dump. We had a little wire fence around it, wasn't much. And I'm standing there with a little rifle <laughs> and this great big tank with these guys all over it, you know, raising hell, you know, everybody was happy. I said, what you guys want? I said, we're going to the dump. We're going to get beer. I said, fellas, I said, the war is over. You want to go home? You better, you better turn around and go back. I says, if you don't, you're going to wind up in, in jail. And you're not going to go home so quick. And it's going to be a lot of trouble. So, they, oh, no, no, we're going to, so look here, you got to remember, the war's over, we're all going home soon, and I'm with this little rifle, this big stuff with a big gun, you know, it's hard to believe. I'm standing, there. you saw that little guy in front of that tank in, in, in China, well, this was even worse, because <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> so finally, they turned around and went back. And uh, people may not realize this, <clears throat> but President Truman saved thousands and thousands of American lives by the atomic bomb. Now, people don't understand this, but that bomb saved my life. I probably wouldn't be here because even Japan, there's a lot of islands also. <clears throat> And we had to have tremendous casualties, tremendous casualties. If you went on the beaches there when I did, you could see that. <clears throat> and people don't understand that because we don't want to see death, and I don't want to see death. But when we getting killed, it's live or die. And President Truman saved my life and thousands of others like him. So that's... Uh, did you realize that at the time, or was it later in life that you realized that? Oh, no, we realized it then. I never thought I'd come back. None of us thought we'd come back. Because we knew the, we knew approximately what the terrain was. We were on islands. We know what islands are. Uh, you don't really have no front and no back on islands, uh, uh, small islands. We wasn't like in Europe. That's massive troops, thousands and thousands. We were small groups. That's why I was in small groups, because those islands needed protection. It really suicide. <clears throat> but no, uh, we, 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 we didn't, uh, most of us didn't think we'd come back. But we didn't really, we cared, but we, we were soldiers. And a soldier mentality is different than today. We had nothing. We've been there for years. I went over, came back the second time. I didn't think I was coming back, but I was in, <clears throat> sent back and uh, we did the best we could and we just tried to survive, let's put it that way. Most soldiers try to survive. They ain't trying to be no heroes. You're a hero because you're thrown into it. You don't want to, you're not a hero because you're going to be a hero like in the movies. These guys that, uh, that uh, was in the fronts and all, they had no way to go. They couldn't back up. They, they had guns and shooting all around them. And I'm, I'm, I'm back there with the <coughs> quartermaster, and if they get through, they're going to get to us too. There's no difference. The island's short, small. Anyway, I got shipped back to, to the States. Uh, from Nagoya, Japan, after after being in Japan. <clears throat> when you were in Japan, did you have many contacts with the Japanese? Yes, I did. Could you talk about that a little bit, what their reaction was to having been defeated in a war and what their attitude was towards the war? Well, uh, yes. Uh, I had quite a, we were in the city. I mean, I was near the city, and I, and I went to the city quite a bit. <clears throat> Japan is such a small country, and these are islands. That, there's really no <coughs> no big country where I was at. There was little towns or villages all through Kyushu, Japan. And the people were very nice. 
the government told them to respect us and treat us with respect, and they did. I was invited to a few homes because those people were curious too. And the Japanese educated people, they're not uh, like, like you think. They educate, they, they, those kids went to school and they learned English, and they learned J Japanese. <clears throat> and I was, but when you come to a Japanese house, Japanese house is, uh, is a little porch, a stoop you come in. You gotta take off your shoes. <clears throat> That's one thing they insist on, is you take off your shoes. Because the floors are made out of felt. And then they throw a rice rug over it. You know, it's in, it's in rice, uh, how we call it, rug or whatever, mat. And they walk uh, with little socks on in the house. They don't, they don't wear shoes. And the doors and the, and the, the rooms are, are made out of sliding Rice paper, like this maybe, but they would slide, and you can make one room, two rooms. All of them were that way. <clears throat> and they would sleep, but they slept on the floor. And I, for a pillow, I'd use a little block like a two by four wrapped in. It, it's not bad. <laughs> it's not good, but it's not bad. And their stove is, uh, this is the average. Uh, they were brick stoves. How did they treat the American soldier? Oh, they treat them good. They treat them as good as they could. They just plain people like us. And they were told what to do, and they did. And we used to go to dances <coughs> in the ballroom there, and we'd buy tickets, you know, a little, and it, 10 cents a ticket or something like that. <coughs> and the Japanese uh, people liked us. Of course, uh, some of the some guys get drunk and all, you know, but they generally like to. <clears throat> I tell you, I'll go back a little bit. Well, first night we hit Japan in Wakayama, Japan. We're gonna look for a geisha house. Believe it or not, this town of Wakayama was flat as a pancake. The American bombers came over and blew up the whole city. Didn't blow up one bridge. There was a lot of bridges. It was amazing the, uh, the, the, the way the pilots and the bombardiers, because they did that, because we were going to come in, see. So the bridges were all intact, but the town was white flat, practically. That's amazing. Our, bomb, our, our, our pilots, uh, well as bombardiers, fantastic. You wouldn't believe it unless you saw it. Uh, but anyway, we came in there that night. I mean, that daytime, we got this. <laughs> we dropped all that. We're going to look for women. We're going to look for women. <laughs> the town's flat, black, dark. A bunch of soldiers, we're going to look. <laughs> they, have, they have houses of prostitution, but it's legal. We didn't know all this stuff, and I'm telling you. Farmers and so forth that needed money had no security. They, they, that they give that daughter to the, they didn't give it to her. It was a gov it was run by the government. Uh, I mean, it was privately owned, but run by the government. So he needed fifteen hundred dollars for his farm. <clears throat> well, the security was his daughter, so she would be into prostitution. But they treated those girls real nice and respect, and they gave them a place to stay and eat and all like that. And they and a percentage of. The money they made went back to buying their freedom. Yeah, it's strange to believe it, but that's uh, that's the way it was. And so, well, where we we did, we went over there, and well, it's different places, just like any other place. <clears throat> but it was it's controlled and it was inspected, you know, be free of uh, of disease and so forth. And uh, they'd take cigarettes, anything, you know, money. That, money really wasn't important to them with cigarettes and food and stuff like that instead of money. They preferred that. And the government uh, set a 15 yen to a dollar. The government, our government, 
they had to give some source of, uh, of, of, of running a country. You just couldn't make the money worthless because people had money, so we backed it up. But people don't know how wonderful the United States of America is. You read in the paper, but you don't know. And we have a most wonderful country. And I, I want to cry when I think about it. Because I've been there. And I can appreciate this country. Well, the country appreciates you, too, for what you did. Well, whatever I did. See, my parents came from Russia. And uh, they never talked about it, but they had no education. They had no money. And they couldn't speak the language. And they succeeded in making a modest living. And that's about the story. That's the gross part of it. I didn't go into all of it. What was your family's feeling when you got back from the war and you were alive and well? <laughs> they were glad to see me. I wrote my parents once a week when I was on the islands, in Christmas Island. And they didn't hear from me for over three months. Either ships got bombed or the planes got down. And my father, that caused him to have a heart attack when the war was over. I came back. He had a heart attack. No, he had a heart attack while I was in service. <clears throat> but I'm sure that's what caused. Oh, they were happy to see me. But I'll tell you something. It wasn't so easy to get a job when you came back. And the people were here didn't appreciate as, as well as we should have been appreciated. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, I came into the States in, in L.A., not L.A., but uh, near L.A., uh, on ship. And we could go where we wanted to. I mean, uh, if they wanted to, some fellas stayed in, the, in California. I came back to the land. I was discharged. But when I came into Atlanta, at Fort McPherson I discharged, I, uh, I didn't recognize the city. It was, I was like a stranger in a foreign country. I had things had changed so much. And fellas that stayed here didn't go to war. Some of them got rich. Some of the companies today, today are still have developed into big companies, because, uh, but those people that stayed here and was in business, they got well. And it was hard to get a, a decent job because I had no skill. So it was worthwhile. And, and so I did go back to work for Shirley Cloak and Dress Company as a stock boy. It was a dress company on Prime Trentis Avenue there. <clears throat> And then I started traveling. You want to know what I did? Sure. I went into business, didn't do so, didn't do good at all. And I started traveling. I sold latest apparel. I represented, uh, last 13, 14 years, I represented Candy Jones Juniors out of Culver, California. It was a dress house manufacturer. And uh, <clears throat> Graf California were out of L.A. They made coordinated latest sportswear. And I, I, I sold latest sports. I, I, I sold. I called on stores, specialty shops, and department stores, mostly specialty shops. And that's what I did most of my life while I was here. When you were in the military, did you realize that you were part of one of the greatest events in world history, in World War II? Did that hit you when you were over there in the Philippines and in the other islands? No, no. It didn't hit us because we didn't know anything. When you're in the service over in those islands, you don't, you got to remember, they don't tell you anything. You don't have any newspapers. You, <clears throat> you couldn't hardly, in the Philippines we did, let's see, in Christmas Island, we did pick up on a radio, regular radio, L.A. and the coastal cities, a few of them, but there was, they were had no news. I didn't know what I was doing for a long time until I started reading about it and piecing the pieces together. 
to Rick and I, like like the St. Lowe deal. I didn't know that they lost so many men in St. Lowe until recent years. I knew that, that that's what happened. They took us all out of the Air Force and put us in, yeah, back in the ground forces, but we didn't know why. So no, you don't. You really, uh, as pl uh, plain common soldiers, didn't know too much about what was going on. <clears throat> and I don't think the the uh, low-level officers knew what was going on. It's the higher echelon people that knew what was going on because. When you take uh, 50,000, 100,000 troops <clears throat> and you're a cog in the wheel, they say, you go here, you go there. They ain't telling you why. They just tell you to do your job. No, we didn't know. You said the greatest thing. No, we didn't realize that. <clears throat> it was very serious. It was serious, but we didn't know why. So. Was there anything that you'd like to say before we conclude? <laughs> your experiences in World War II? My experiences, uh, I was just a plain soldier. I was the first sergeant in charge of the troops in, in, uh, in Fort Horn, California, but I didn't do anything. Well, I nearly died on an island. I had a, a fever. Uh, it's a fever that uh, that you pick up from the islands. And I, I nearly died in a hospital, a tent hospital. It wasn't too much bigger than this on a little island. <laughs> there wasn't no hospital. It's just a place to put. They put you in a bed, and if you lived, you're okay. If you didn't, they buried you. Uh, of course, there was no facilities, and, and uh, I couldn't move my fingers at one time. I was, had so much fever. And that's the only time I felt, well, maybe I wasn't going to make it to, to get out of that bunk. The only thing I worried about wasn't about my life. I was worried about some Japanese soldier coming in there and sticking a bayonet through my stomach. It's funny, that's what I thought. Well, we just uh, did the best we could. A lot of little things, but they don't mean much, you know. Like I got nickel cigars, <laughs> the PX, <laughs> sometimes for nothing. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I smoked a lot of cigars over there because they were cheap. And they didn't, a lot of them didn't cost me anything because I worked in certain dumps that I had a few things. <clears throat> That's about it. I could have made a lot of money in the Philippines <clears throat> selling rice, but I wouldn't do it because they, they would offer me these uh, entrepreneurs or whatever. You know, there's always somebody trying to offer me $100 a bag of rice. It's a 100-pound bag of rice. <clears throat> I just wouldn't ra raise that way. Some people make money maybe, but very few. I don't know. But uh, I had some offers that uh, I could have made some real money. But I could have also gone to jail too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the way I was raised. That's not the way I am. Now, that's about it. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. And uh, more than that, thank you for what you did for the country. Oh, you're yeah, welcome. And, uh, you're quite thank welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, the greatest value we have in this country is freedom. You don't realize what freedom is. Until you go to other countries and experience their way of life and their way of speaking. We can do anything we want here as long as it's legal. Uh, in other countries, you can't do that. You can't open your mouth. You get thrown in jail. You get killed. And a lot, many countries, but this country, we have a tremendous amount of freedom. And everybody wants to come to this country. You look around you, we got everybody from Europe, from from France, from anywhere, the Japanese, they all want to come to this country. We've taught them to be educated. A lot of them, they go back home and then they take our jobs with them. That's what worries me more than anything else. We, 
we've 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 trained these boys took these people to colleges of ours. They taught them electronics, taught them computers, and we're we're just losing a lot of our skilled workers to foreign countries because they work so much cheaper. Well, thank you for sharing your feelings and thank you for your. <laughs> <laughs> okay.